What's up, YouTube? This is Guy with the Just Bluefish channel coming to you live with my good friend AB from Watch Collecting Strategy. Hey, AB, how are you doing today? Hey, how's it going, man? Thanks for having me. So this is sort of a quick impromptu live stream because AB has a crazy ridiculous schedule and can never manage to get together with us all at the uh, all at the same time, uh, we got uh, a mod in the comments. Actually, where's David? I I, I tried, getting, tried getting in touch with David, asking him to come on, and yeah, we just been have real problems, like all of us connecting our schedules. So hopefully, he shows up. I sent him the link. If he doesn't make it, you guys are going to be stuck with just me and AB today. But we got a couple of talk uh, topics to talk about, and uh, yeah, the first one that I wanted to get started with today is based on a question that I got from a viewer in an email recently. And I know, A.B., you've got a lot of experience with this topic, so I thought that you're uh, just, you know, the perfect person to, to kind of ask this question to. The, the email that I got from the viewer was basically along the lines of, he owns a Zin 104, and it's having a problem with the date change mechanism. It won't change over correctly. Something was broken with it, but otherwise the watch is working okay. He got a hold of uh, the place he bought it from. I believe the dealer that sells Zin is watchbuys.com or something like that. And they suggested he send it to a specific um, service center, uh, not affiliated with Zin, like an independent, right? So, the long and short of the story that he sent me was that he got a bunch of sticker shock when they told him servicing this Zen 104 was going to cost plus or minus $450. I think that's something that is just horribly overlooked by people when they're getting into the watch hobby and when they start building up a collection. They're not taking the time to consider that all of these watches at some point in time are going to require service, right? Now, there's a couple of different angles that I want to look at this from. First of all, specifically to the viewer that sent me this email question, to his perspective, what do you do about quote-unquote affordable watches? We'll say watches under $1,000 that are going to incur service costs that might equal half or more of the value of the watch. How do you approach it from that specific angle? And we're also going to talk about more expensive watches too. I know you've serviced some vintage watches in the past, AB. How do you approach that as well? But let's stick to the affordables. You know, if you've got a 200, a 500, or even a thousand dollar watch, and now it's time for service at a cost of three, four, five hundred dollars, how do you approach that, AB? So when it comes to, first of all, I understand why the watch buys, I believe they're the only German focused um, watch sellers here in the US. So I believe they want him to send it to an independent watchmaker because so that he doesn't have to send it to um, Germany. Because in the end of the day, I believe it used to be ETA 2824 and then now they're using a Salida SW200. So the base cost for a service with an ETA, I believe, is around 350 bucks. My problem is I, I collected a lot of things. I collected a lot of affordable watches. I collected vintage. I collected... I collected pretty much, I tried everything. And what I found is if you're buying affordable watches, it's very easy for you to buy a lot of them. But then you kind of, if you keep them for a long time, eventually you're going to have to service all of them. And a base sure. cost service is about $350. So let's say you buy a Seiko that costs you about $350. Something people need to consider is eventually you're going to pay the price of that watch to service it, you know what I mean? So the way I approach it is I don't kind of factor in price, the price of the watch. I factor in, I factor in how much I love the watch. If the, I love the watch enough that I, I'm going to want to keep it forever, even if it's an affordable Seiko, then I'm mentally going to be prepared to service that watch. But if yeah. I just keep buying tons of affordable watches, if I have 20, 30 affordable watches, all of a sudden I'm going to have to service 10 of them and that's going to be a really, really big bill. You know what I mean? And in the end of the day, I probably like four of those watches out of the 30. Um, so that's how I would approach it is when you buy watches, be very considerate of what you're buying because these are mechanical watches. 
eventually you're gonna have to service it. There's no getting around it. You know what I mean? Yeah, they they all require maintenance. They all, frankly, eventually break down. Mm -hmm. um, solid stud mentions for sentimental value, and I think that's you know what you're getting at is if the watch has some sort of meaning to you that's greater than the purchase price, you go ahead, you spend the money, and you get the watch serviced. Let me go through the comments real quick. I've got some people rolling in here. Um, Lordy Sparkler, uh, keep up the great content guy. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate that. I will do my best. And with the help of AB, hopefully we'll have some great content here today. He carries these shows for me. So I'm, I'm just here to kind of pull the reins on him when he gets too carried away. But otherwise, it's the AB show. And I'm totally fine with that because he knows more about watches than I do by a long shot. Um, Frank Handy says, what's up, guy? How you doing, Frank? Uh, Christian M, servicing equals minimal vintage one or two pieces. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about vintage servicing because I know AB's had to deal with that a lot in the past or at least somewhat. I don't know about a lot. He'll probably fill us in on that. Now, do you think if you're going to service a watch that you know you don't really have a lot of sentimental value for because of course we're going to keep those watches taken care of we're going to uh tr tr try to keep them in the collection and by virtue of doing that you have to get them serviced eventually let's say you get a 350 dollars seiko or a hamilton or something that that you like but ultimately the time comes where you know it's quote unquote time to put it out to pasture Unfortunately, at this price tier, they're kind of disposable watches almost, right? Like it's cheaper to just buy a new one to, than to get it serviced. And um, I think that's okay. But what about when you reach this kind of funny tier, like the viewer that sent me the email question is at mm -hmm. of $1,000 for a Zen 104 and a service quote of 400 and just around 450 bucks. Now it's it starts to become this issue of whether or not it's actually a sentimental watch, but you do like it. It's this weird value situation where like, do you want to put half the value of the watch into this service? And, you know, I'm trying to advise him on that. And again, in his case, it was just that the date complication wasn't functioning correctly. Otherwise the watch was running. You know, my, my, my position to him was either a, don't do anything. Just wait till the watch breaks down completely and gets it serviced. That might annoy a lot of people, and they might say, I can't deal with a, a piece of the watch not working. Uh, B, you could just sell the watch. Somebody would buy that watch, and then you know you would lose money on it, obviously, but get it out of the collection, get something different. Or or C, bite the bullet and take the, take the service cost if it is a watch you care about. I can't really you know, say what I think is the best option there. So what do you do with a, you know, thousand, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollar watch? It's going to have that, th th you know, third to half the value of the watch in service because mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier when we're talking about three hundred dollar watches. But you get into this kind of weird area in that thousand dollar range. So my opinion on that is I don't really think the second option is a good one because he's going to lose a lot of money when he sells a watch that's broken to the point where he might as well just fix it. You know what I mean? Because when you lose $350 or pay $350, you know, at that point, just keep the watch. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but first of all, I think $450 for the problem he's having with an SW200 is overpriced by $100. So find a different watchmaker. They'll fix it for $350. Um, second, it becomes a little bit more reasonable if you can shave a hundred bucks off of that quote. Yeah, because 450 for a problem with the date change with a Salida SW200, which is a movement that's very easy to service. Um, I think that's a little bit pricey. Um, actually, a hundred dollars more than you should spend, in my opinion. There's a lot of watchmakers that service ETA movements for me personally. Um, it's all about 350 dollars, that's the base cost. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends on how much he loves that watch. If he does have sentimental value, then I think he should, you know, he should service it. I don't think he should sell it broken or if he can live with it, with the date problem, um, just wait till it breaks down. Like you said, I think that's really good advice, but um, I don't think he should sell it. I think if he has sentimental value, just service it, you know, because when you buy mechanical watches in the future for this viewer, 
if he buys mechanical watches, just keep in mind that this is kind of a lesson that if you're going to buy a watch, make sure you're going to be okay with servicing it. You know, I have a watch personally right now that the base service is $850. Yeah. And I know I love this watch, so I'm okay with that. It's a lot of money. I'm not saying it's not, but I'm okay with that. You know, people don't know, for example, I see a lot of people saving up for Royal Oaks. Royal Oaks, I've seen service costs. Like I've talked with a lot of collectors that say, hey, you know, I love my 15202, but my base service cost was about $2,000. You know what I mean? And I said, that's when the debate of in-house and ETA, that's when you stop caring about that debate. That's when you're going to wish that that was an ETA movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's why well, I don't care about in-house or ETA as long as it's solid, you know, because service right. will. Let's uh, take a look at the comments here. Get caught up. Uh, MR or Mr. He, he asked what uh, what happened to Just Horology. Someone else asked earlier. I'll for anyone that's wondering, David, um, I couldn't get a hold of him. I sent both AB and uh, uh, David links to the show. Uh, hopefully he gets that link and joins us. Um, we've had all sorts of issues over the last several weeks, getting everyone's schedules matched up. AB's uh, very busy. David's in London. We're in the US, time, time zones and everything. So yeah, hopefully David shows up. Uh, I did send him a message asking him to join us. Um, Ahmad asks, uh, I just got a new movement for my SKX, sold the last one for parts. That's much cheaper. Yeah, I mean, if you can maybe either A, do it yourself is ideal, right? Or B, get a watchmaker that can give you your old parts back. Maybe you can part those out, sell it, and get some of your expense back on, on the cost of the service. Very valid yeah. point. That was actually what I was going to suggest with um, the lower, kind of more affordable. Like, for example, a Sarb 033 or something, let's say even an SKX, right? I was going to say if your watch breaks, instead of getting it serviced or getting rid of the watch because, you know, it's kind of a shame to just dispose of it, um, you can use it as a positive thing and try to learn how to fix it yourself. You know what I mean? Um, one of the guys, Jack Forrester from Houdinki, he was talking in a podcast about how he got really into mechanical watches and how he did that was when he had to first put a watch together, I think, or he fixed his first watch, something like that. Um, that's when he had a deeper appreciation for watches. And I feel like that's a good way to kind of not dispose of the watch and learn something new, um, you know, take a negative and make it a positive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good points all around. Uh, let's see, try to catch up with some of these comments, guys. I will be checking the comments as often as possible. If you have questions, comments, uh, we'll get to them. It's going to take a little while, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking at them, so don't worry. Uh, let's see, d d scrolling through here. Uh, walked into an AD Sunday, pulled the trigger on a Datejust 41 uh, Wimbledon dial they had in the case. Wow, that's cool. Congratulations. What do you think about that Wimbledon dial? Real quick, give us your... Uh, your uh, two cents on that dial, AB. I, I have no idea. What's a Wimbledon dial? That sounds like something from Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> All right. So you've never seen it. Well, I'm not yeah. going to pull up a picture. It'll take up too much time. But uh, but yeah, I actually like that dial a lot. So congratulations on that one, buddy. Um, so we have uh, a comment here from... Uh, Matt S. I stopped buying Seikos and sold the bunch I have. Now that I own two Rolexes, it's tough to wear any of the other ones except for my G-Shock at the gym and my Reactor at construction sites. I actually don't know what the Reactor brand is. I've never seen that one. But I'm kind of in the exact same boat. Like it's, it's When I go to my watch box and I have what, six or seven watches now, it's like there's my Submariner, there's my G-Shock, and like nine out of ten times I'm pulling one of those out and I kind of got to force myself to pick something different even the speedmaster which i think is a great watch i don't pull it out and wear it as often as i should where's what's your kind of go-to watch are you pretty disciplined in changing it up from day to day uh i'm not disciplined uh, i will say this i don't think it has to do with the brand i think it just has to do with what's your favorite watch the watch i've been wearing every single day and i kind of almost have to force myself to wear the submariner is this guy the master geographic um, even though it's a dress watch, I love this watch. And every single time I go to the watch box, I either pick this one up or the Grand Seiko SBGA 415. Um, I don't think it really has to do with the brand that because he got two Rolexes. I just think because it's his favorite watch. Um, yeah. 
when you and have favorites, it's yeah. like you just can't help yourself, right? You know, I, yeah. I know what you, I know what you guys I know what you guys mean. Uh, let's see. Try to catch up with some more of these comments here. Uh, Brett, uh, no service on cheap watches. Buy it. Buy another watch. And valid, you know. I mean, especially when you're talking about two and three hundred dollar watches. If it wasn't a gift, if it wasn't uh, your first watch, if it was wasn't something you really truly love, uh, yeah. I mean, that's often the answer. Is uh, just get something new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here's a great comment the long review king and the camera aesthetics prince and it's funny i'm gonna point this out because me and ab were just talking yesterday i'm gonna unveil this concept that ab and i were talking about yesterday hopefully he doesn't mind and it was mostly his idea we were, we're gonna try to like do some uh i guess you call it a collaboration where he's gonna do his beautiful cinematic high quality you know five six seven minute long review style videos then i'm gonna take that watch and i'm gonna do a long 20 30 40 minute in-depth review of that watch we're going to try to find a few watches that we can do that back and forth thing with and th through the course of the video you know we'll say like okay go go watch ab watch collecting strategies really amazing high quality video on this if you want to see all the pretty stuff and he'll say go watch guys long long form review if you want to get all crazy and technical and nitpicky um i think that might be something really cool hopefully we can make that happen and hopefully you guys will enjoy that kind of back and forth review style content you know, I think that would be really cool because a lot of times people ask me to um, make my videos a lot longer. And my problem is, to be honest, when you make videos like the one I do, um, where you're trying to make it as cinematic as possible, as aesthetically pleasing as possible, you're taking a hundred different shots and editing could take up to sometimes eight hours for me to edit stuff. It's hard to make a video beyond six or seven minutes. You know what I mean? So a lot of people ask me for longer reviews and I feel like that concept will be good. I'm going to get to my quick points about the watch and then if they want something long in depth for them to actually have pull, before they pull the trigger, then I can send them over to your video or vice versa. You know what I mean? Um, I yeah. think that'll be really cool. I love the idea. I thought that was brilliant. Hopefully we can, you know, not, not do it all the time, but every time we find like a really cool watch where it might really be worth it and we can do something special. I think it's a great idea. Mm. All right. More comments, more comments. They're stacking up. Sorry, guys. We're slow. It's just the way it goes. Um, solid stud. Anything mechanical will inherently fail. Makes sense. Never thought about my watches failing since I just joined the watch collecting hobby. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't account for is like when we started this discussion about servicing and the cost and whatnot. People, uh, you know, they buy a watch, then another, then another, then another. And it's easy in the course of two or three years to suddenly have like a huge collection of watches. And you never considered like in another couple of years, these watches are going to be needing service one after another. And it can get out of hand for sure. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to jump to the topic of vintage because this is very important for me to mention when we're talking about this. This is something that kind of bugs me and I kind of cringe a little bit when I find this. Um, a lot of people have been promoting vintage watches recently. You know, I'm not going to mention names, um, but they're saying it's like the best thing ever, you know, and then coincidentally, they have shops for it. But anyway, um, the problem with vintage watches, for example, I see a lot of collectors, they send me emails. They're like, hey, you know, would you do a collection review for me? And I kind of tell them. As of late, I've been focusing with more review videos. But when I take a look at their collection, I see that they just started like probably a year ago based on their message. And they have like 10 or 12 vintage watches. Wow. A lot of those watches are dead brands. Dead brands, in a sense, are brands that died during the quartz crisis. The first thing, the reason why I cringe is because you can't get those watches serviced. Because unless you turn it into a Franken, a lot of those parts will need to be changed and you can't get the original parts anymore. You know, um, sure. most vintage watches are never going to keep accurate time, very special occasions where you're going to have proper water resistance, basically only oyster case or oyster cases um, and some old Seamasters, but most vintage watches don't even have water resistance, you know? So for someone like me and you guy, where we live, it rains all the time. Yeah, you know what humid. I mean? It's just crazy, crazy humid. It, and damage is going to happen, especially like there's something very simple that could happen. It happened to me. For example, it's really hot where I live. I keep the AC at like 68. And then as soon as I go from my house outside to extreme heat, all of a sudden I see um, water vapor under the crystal. 
You know what I mean? Because you're going from a really cold climate to a really hot climate. And that small little mistake could damage your vintage watch. You know what I mean? And service cost, if you can even service those watches, is going to be insane. Like I had an IWC Peloton 8541. Um, it was a fantastic watch. But when I, when I was about to service it, I got a quote because there's a lot of problems with it. First of all, I got a quote that he might not be able to find the original parts. Second, I got a quote of almost $1,000 to fix that watch. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and what did that watch cost you? 750 bucks. So you were going to have, a, you were <laughs> going to have a, what is that? 30 plus percent cost of service over the, the price that you paid for the watch. I mean, you better really exactly. love that watch. Exactly. I, I kept it in the safe. <laughs> it is sentimental. Um, but the problem is I'm kind of, upset about it because I didn't think about it. Every collector makes mistakes. You know, I still make mistakes. This is my fourth master geographic that I read bought. You know what I mean? Like everybody makes mistakes, but for me personally, I wish somebody told me or reminded me that, Hey, first of all, vintage watches are really delicate. And I'm going to say this again, because a lot of people always mention the oyster case, except they just, and whatever. Um, it's just, it kind of sucks. You know what I mean? That the, a lot of things could happen to these watches and service costs will determine whether you're going to be able to keep it for the rest of your life or not. You know? Yeah. I actually did a video a while back talking about, um, should you buy vintage watches? And my position on it was no, at least for me, I, like that's a whole rabbit hole that I'm, I've been, you know, only in this hobby for three or four years. Like I ain't going down that rabbit hole yet. I'm nowhere <laughs> near to the level of knowledgeable. I don't have like, a roster, if you will, of people that I can trust to, to, to refer to for servicing, for authentication. Like, I, I just think, at least for me, I think it's a bad idea to go down that rabbit hole. Lots of people I, know a lot more about it than I do, and they they navigate those waters okay, but mm -hmm. I stay away, stay away. I go, I'm going to say no and yes. You know how, like, there's, for example, you know, stamp collectors and coin collectors. There's some collectors in the watch community that don't wear their watches, that's a specific style of collecting that I completely agree. Collect vintage. Vintage watches are cool. You know what I mean? There's a lot of cool stuff. I believe someone like John Goldberger, um, I believe he does that, where he buys a lot of watches that he kind of keeps in his house and he collects them for what they are, but he doesn't really wear them. You know what I mean? Some people will find that a shame. It's just a different style of collecting. And at that, in that case, I'm like, yeah, you know, buy your vintage watches. You won't be wearing them anyway you know, something happening to that watch will be less likely because you're not wearing them. But if you're a person like me, I, it bugs me if I don't wear a watch. If I don't wear a watch and I find myself not wearing it for a month, I sell it to buy something that I would wear, you know? Um, yeah, sure. That's when it kind of becomes an issue. Let's, uh, let's check some more comments here, try to get caught up. Uh, we got SL, was up? Hey, you remember that commercial from, uh, what, like, Quite a while ago, the, the Budweiser was up uh, commercials. Hey, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us today. Uh, Bobby Legs, hello all. Hey, how you doing, Bobby? Modern Times, hope I didn't miss too much. Uh, we've been on for 20 minutes now, uh, but that, this message was from 15 minutes ago. So no, at that point, you didn't miss too much, buddy. We're, we're just talking watch servicing uh, because uh, uh, I got an email from a viewer with, with an issue with servicing questions. Um, somebody else asked, I noticed, uh, where's David from just horology. I've addressed that question already twice, but just for anyone that's wondering, that's new, that has just got here. Um, we've just been having a heck of a time, like lining up our schedules. Cause he's in London, AB's we're super busy with stuff and we're in the U S and I sent him the link and asked him to join us. Hopefully he shows up. It doesn't look like he's going to, but, uh, I'm just going to I'm gonna say it right now, because I feel like that's what people are asking. We don't, there's no beef. Like he's just, he just, um, he's busy right now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's I like, just feel it's like, like <laughs> it's like guy in AB without David. What's going on? I, I get the feeling yeah. like we're, we're the least two popular characters of this show. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should go. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, lots of people talking about the service discussion in the comments, some good comments here, but I want to get a little bit more caught up. So I'm not going to touch on every single one. That's not really a, a question. Um, the watch lounge. Hey, what's up? Uh, if you guys don't, uh, don't, you should go check out watch Lounge's channel. He's a good guy. We talk a lot and, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today here, buddy. 
Uh, Blue Shirt Buddha, hey guy, always nice to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us, Blue Shirt. I see a, uh, a super chat just popped up. Let me try to find that. This interface in StreamYard is kind of uh, not great for super chats. Um, from Cowboy, Cowboy Swami, he asks us, uh, Zin, U1 or UX? Teg Substeel, toughest watch on the market. I don't know what the UX is. I've seen the U1, and stylistically, I'm not super crazy about that watch. What do you think about that, AB? I would go with the U1. I believe, if I remember correctly, the UX is a quartz-based watch. Um, I don't... I remember reading about it. I don't remember much about it. I believe it's a course based watch and I would go with the U1 for sure. Um, yeah. I kind of like the way the U1 looks. I know it's weird, but it looks really tooly to the point where I feel like it's actually really, really cool. Um, I would go with the U1 for sure. Yeah, the, the gentleman, I did a review of the Zin 556 not too long ago and the gentleman that owned that had a U1 also. And uh, I looked at it briefly. The, the 556, though, for me, like that's my favorite Zen watch. There's something about it. I think it's awesome. The 104, don't get me wrong, very cool watch, too. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, Zen watches in general, I have been nothing but impressed with them. Very, uh, very nicely built watches. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for that super chat, by the way. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, here's a question regarding the more affordable watch services that we were discussing a little while ago. How much does it cost for a brand new SW 200 off the top of my head? I want to say it's, I don't know, 200 bucks, something like that, somewhere in that ballpark, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, if, if you can replace a movement yourself, like, you know, you could save a lot of money on the service and just buy one and put it in. It's just taking unless off. there's a, unless the watch they start stamping parts of the movement um you know if you yeah you can just switch it out but you know like for example if you have um a movement even though there's a lot of people that modify their eta movements or sw200 movements and stuff like that maybe that's the case where you might want to service it uh, but other than that yeah you you could always do that yeah switching out the dial the hands like that stuff's not super hard if you want to learn a little bit um, mm -hmm. And especially on affordable watches, you, it's not like you're risking a lot. It's kind of like you had mentioned, uh, sort of a good way to learn about watches. Uh, you're referencing who was a Jack Forrester earlier. You know, that's basically what he did, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think he, uh, yeah, I think he he actually bought a lot of um, a lot of broken movements. I can't remember, but it was something along those lines. I actually saw. Uh, a question here for you that uh, I found really interesting by Timepiece Chat. If you want to highlight that, I'm kind of curious what your answer is. Um, when was it asked? Because I'm I'm looking at questions asked at 4:15. Still, I'm way, way, was, way behind. It was right before the super chat. Okay, so uh, let me scroll all the way down there. Um, Oops. Guy, with you only wearing your Sub or G-Shock regularly, would you ever consider trimming down to a two-watch collection? Yeah, actually, if I wasn't doing the YouTube thing, I would probably only own those two watches. Maybe one more um, to have, like, a three-piece. But for sure, I could see being perfectly happy with just those two watches. Since I do YouTube, uh, I feel compelled to, to have a little bit of a bigger collection, but I don't want even doing the youtube 20 30 40 watches in my collection I'm, I'm happy with what i have right now which i think is right around six or seven i don't suspect i'll ever get too far above that and i have access to watches from a number of different sources so that i can still bring you know content to the channel and not have to keep buying and buying and buying which is super super fortunate and it's really nice to have that um what about you ab you ever consider going down to just two or three you're kind of like a three big watches anyway kind of guy aren't you i used to be three big but then ever since i bought my g-shock it has to be four with the g-shock because that i i'm gonna admit this i used to hate g-shock and uh, to be honest most of their designs i really dislike um but the one i bought the dw 5600m or something it's i call it the evil shock because it has like the, the negative display, out, right black black um display with red numbers that's why i call it the evil shock um but now it's four. I think three big watches and one G-Shock would be absolutely incredible. Sure, Actually, sure. that's what I have right now. I have a four watch collection with three watches and the G-Shock. 
It's a good number. I mean, everyone's different. I know lots of people like just having tons and tons of watches. I don't begrudge anyone for their for their choices of how they like to collect. But for me, I don't I don't like feeling overwhelmed by my collections. It's kind of why I got out of comic books. Actually, you might notice my, my little Batman poster up behind me. But yeah, I, I got out of comic books because it was just buy more, buy more, buy more. I got to get them all like, you know, the Pokemon thing or whatever. And I just couldn't deal with it anymore. So I try to be really concise with my collecting stuff. Um, we got a message here. Watch Lounge. I'm I'm getting there for the Explorer. I just need to flip a few more watches. You're going to see a video from me and probably the next week or so. I was able to borrow an Explorer 139 millimeter. I've been asked so many times in the last couple of years, do you regret selling that watch? Do you wish you still had it? And the truth is I didn't know how to answer that question because after I sold it, I never really saw it again. So at the time when I sold it, I was really sure, like, yeah, this isn't the watch for me. But as time goes on, you kind of forget, like, you know, how do you really feel about something? Your tastes change, opinions change. So I've had that watch for uh, a week and... Uh, you know, spoiler alert, I guess you'll have to wait for the full video, but I called up AB on the first day and I was like, dude, am I crazy? I'm thinking about buying this watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you will eventually. I, maybe, I don't know. We'll see. I, I'll, I'll have more information about the Explorer 1 saga uh, in, my, in, in an upcoming video in the next week or so. Ahmad asks, uh, is it Ahmad? Ahmad? I, I'm sorry if I Ahmad. that. Ahmad. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. I guess that would be the right way to say it. I don't know. Um, how do you spot a fake Sarbo 1-7? I have two can see a few differences. Man, I, I wouldn't even begin to know how to spot a fake Sarb or any kind of more entry-level Seiko watch like that. Do you, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, the fakes for the Seiko Sarb 033 and so on, they're t- absolutely terrible. Um, you definitely have to be blind to not be able to spot it. Like If, if you look at this... I was gonna say, if you're seeing just like small differences, like I've sat down lots of examples of SKXs, for example, and there's always small differences because those those that level of watches are very inconsistently manufactured. So it just might be manufacturing inconsistencies and nothing to do with fake versus real. Um, Not to mention, like from a business perspective, um, it doesn't make any sense for you know the replica makers to make a fake SARB. You know what I mean? Like for them to perfect the SARB, it's going to cost them so much with very little return that I highly doubt that there's a high end one out there, but I could be wrong. Maybe they did it, but I just, even from like a, even though it's a bad business from a business perspective, um, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Turkey Vulture fixed the Hamilton khaki once water damage, damn push in crown. Yeah. That's, you know, a lot of people, um, talk about the screw down crown as being like uh, it's not water resistant unless the screw down crown is screwed down or like the screwing down portion increases the water resistance. And really that's not the point. The, The point of the screw down crown on most watches is just to keep you from inadvertently pulling the crown out (laughs) like there are some like the submariner with trip lock there are some really more expensive watches that do have an extra gasket when you screw it down but a lot of the more affordable watches like yeah the screw down crown doesn't enhance the water resistance it just keeps the crown from being inadvertently pulled out when when it's underwater um yeah it happens to to the best of us i'm sure uh matter of fact my dad has lost several watches because of that very problem. It's never happened to me, but I don't ever find myself going yeah. swimming. So I don't worry about that too much. I will say this. Stop showering with your watches. That's, Do you that's shower with watches it. ever? I've never done it. I, I know, is that a thing? I, I know it's a thing. I have a lot of people that have asked me before. Uh, I know a lot of my dad's friends that do it. Um, because they wear their watches and they never, ever take it off. And a lot of people do actually shower with their watches. Stop doing that. <laughs> that's that's all I'm gonna say. I can't. I can't. Where's my finger? I'm, it's, it's weird. Like the camera's kind of backwards. I can't sleep with a watch on, and I don't shower with a watch on. Those are like the yeah. only two times my watches come off. Um, yeah, it doesn't never really even occurred to me to wear my watch in the shower. I don't know. I guess maybe if I was like traveling with like my Submariner somewhere where, well, I would never travel somewhere where I feel like it's shady, but you know, in the <laughs> fantasy world where that happens and I'm like, I don't trust leaving it sitting out, uh, out anywhere away from me. Maybe then I'd be like, okay, I'm just like for safety reasons. But when I'm at home, no, I always take it off. Yeah. I do clean it 
under the faucet with a little like dish soap and stuff once eh, once a month maybe if i mm -hmm. wear it a lot but but no i've never taken it in the shower like bar soap like i when i take a shower i use bar soap i don't use any crazy fancy like squishy soaps or anything uh mm -hmm. that stuff i would think that that would like accumulate you know what i mean like bar yeah. soap is not probably ideal for your watches yeah no but the, i i just i just think that um because what uh, watches are water resistant you know what i mean to a certain degree but they're not how can i put this water vapor resistant uh, well what was the word Anyway, I, I just think don't shower with your watches. Um, if, like you said, yeah. you're in a shady place, sleep with your watch. Um, but even then, like, just don't do it. I see it. Jack asked in the in the chat. I have the YouTube chat open, so I see the current chats, but I also have the the Streamyard chat. He said bar soap question mark like a bar <laughs> of soap. Like you know, you go buy like like Dial or, or Irish Spring or whatever. Um, I don't know. Is, is bar soap not a normal word? Like that's what I call it—a bar of soap, right? Yeah, no, it's correct. <laughs> All right, All right Jack. I think so. I'm not. I'm not picking on you, but uh, but yeah, that's just what I call it. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, oh yeah, actually, I was going to comment on you were talking about um, water vapor. I've heard, and I don't know—is this a myth? Don't take your watch in the hot tub, like a yeah, don't. like a jacuzzi or whatever. Is that mm -hmm. bad? Yeah, I've never, I've never, it's never crossed my mind to do it. I mean, to be mm -hmm. fair, I have not been in a jacuzzi in God knows how long. So I don't, you know, like this, the situation never even comes up for me to consider it. So yeah, I, I have heard that. I don't know if it was a myth or not. So I, I have my, here, here's how I learned like a lot of this is from my watchmaker. Back then I made a video that will never see the light of day. Um, I told my watchmaker we'll redo it because back then I was filming with a potato you know, my phone and it was terrible quality. And I decided there's no point releasing it that way. So I'm going to reshoot it. But one of the things my watchmaker said was, you know, I asked him, what should you do to avoid damaging your watches? One of the biggest things he told me is never take a hot shower, specifically a hot shower with your watches and don't go in a jacuzzi with your watch, even if you're trying to impress, you know? Yeah. And I told him, I was like, okay, you know, he's, a, he's been a watchmaker for about 30 plus years. So I trust him with that. You know, he said a lot of other things, but that, that was two points. He made sure he's like, don't ever do it, you know, period. And if I. Yeah, I've, uh, I, it's never even crossed my mind to try it. So, uh, anyway, next question slash comment. I just received word from the AD that I'll receive a black Bay 58 on bracelet. I ordered next week. I think it's as close to a perfect watch. Super excited. Congratulations, Robert. I still haven't seen a Black Bay 58 in person yet, and I'm dying to. I'm going to be honest, the standard Black Bay range of dive watches, I was not super impressed with. I think this is an incredibly well-built watch. I think it's very high quality. I think that it's a really good value at the price, but the design of it does not really get me super excited. The overall shape and the case, the size, uh, the snowflake hands. I'm not crazy about that particular watch, but the Black Bay 58 looks, other than the snowflake hands, like a really awesome watch. So congratulations. A lot of, a lot of people are still talking about the soap. <laughs> <laughs> the soap is a popular topic. I'll just change the title of this to soap when, uh, <laughs> when we're done. Maybe that'll get lots of views. Yeah. I think the Black Bay 58 is a fantastic, fantastic watch. Um, I wanted to wait for a lot of people to test the movement because like the Black Bay GMT, it had a lot of problems with the date changing mechanism, you know, kind of coincidentally. But um, I'm waiting for a Black Bay 58 in blue. If they release that, I might pick it up. I used to own the 41 millimeters. It was a great watch. It was very thick, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I like thick watches, but it was just kind of, it was very top heavy. So I eventually sold it. But I'm waiting. The 58 has better dimensions. It kind of looks better. It looks slimmer. Um, and I would probably go with the blue one. Uh, yeah, I think kind of like the Black Bay full-size blue with the more silver dial and not the gilt dial. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that I would like to see them create in the Black Bay 58. Is that the same one you're talking about? Or are you talking about an actual blue dial? No, no, no. The, the black black dial with the blue bezel. Right, yeah. Okay. We're on the yeah, same page. That's, that's my dream Rolex Submariner, actually. 
for them to come out with a black dial with blue bezel, that would be that would be absolutely incredible. Brand 700. I love the Planet Ocean black ceramic case. Something different than Rolex. Guy, I'm still waiting for you to get your Pepsi. I haven't warmed up to the ceramic case idea yet. And for that matter, a blacked out PVD coated case even. I like a nice shiny stainless steel. I think that that's like what gets me, you know, kind of kind of enthused about uh, about, you know, tool watches in general, I guess. Um, but yeah, the ceramic case has some pluses, right? Like it should never get really scratched up. It's going to look like awesome forever, basically. So so that is a cool aspect. Regarding the Pepsi, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting still. I think I'm going to be on that list forever. Um, but AB, what do you think about the newer types of materials that they're using? Some of these watchmakers, ceramic cases, sapphire cases. I've seen watches made out of entirely out of sapphire. Um, you <laughs> hoop Yeah, exactly. Um, I am on the same page with you. I mean, it's a cool watch. I feel like a lot of people can pull it off. You know what I mean? Um, but I personally can't pull off an all black watch. The only one I can is my G-Shock. I'd like to think so at least. Um, but as far as people innovating, I love that. That's why, you know, I'm just going to say right now, that's why I don't hate Hublot. You know what I mean? Because people, you know, a lot of snobs will be like, oh, you know, it's fun to hate on Hublot. But you have Hublot, you have Richard Mill, you have all those people. They're trying to create new things in the world. They're trying to innovate. They're trying to... Yeah, they hate Hublot because sometimes they use ETA movements, but they make up for it by using crazy, you know, materials. I hate the way they look. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't buy one personally. I wouldn't wear it. But I respect them for, you know, innovating, for being out there, for using crazy materials. You know what I mean? That was the, the whole concept of what they call the fusion. They have the Big Bang Fusion. The reason why they call it the fusion is it's a mix of two materials, three materials, whatever it is. Um, making a watch fully made out of sapphire, I'm sorry, but you'll be crazy to not at least find that interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't hate Hublot watches. Actually, I think it was you that introduced me to the, the more modestly sized Big Bang watch. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really liked that one actually. Would I buy it? Eh, probably not, because there's so many other watches that I like better. But it's cool. Got a couple of uh, super chats popped up here. First one from Eric Slofer. Uh, three watches in rotation. It should expend, extend service. $2. Thanks for that, Eric. That obviously certainly not necessary, but I appreciate it. And if you guys don't watch Eric's channel, I think the name of the channel is just Eric Slofer. You got to think of like a creative watch name channel, Eric, so that I can be like, go see, you know, whatever, watch, whatever. Uh, or Big E, as, as we like to call him. He's also on my Facebook group. Super awesome guy, has great videos. Go check him out. But anyway, he has three watches in rotation, extend service. If you space out the purchases, absolutely, right? And if you, if, if you buy them all like in the same year, then they're probably all gonna <laughs> be ready for service at about the same time. I mean, some watches, you know, they go earlier, they go later. Um, but yeah, for sure, if you have a good rotation of watches like that, and if it's spaced out enough, um, absolutely, good point. That's actually um, kind of what I'm I'm personally doing. Um, before, when I had when I first bought the JLC Master Geographic, the very first time, I had a bigger collection. I sold it because I wasn't comfortable with the service cost. I was like, okay, if I have this one, I have my Omega Speedmaster, I have a lot of things. I'm going to have to service. This one is the most expensive service. I'm not comfortable with it. But now I kind of have a strategy with the way I collect. I have one that's going to be relatively easy to service, which is my Submariner. And yep. then I have the Grand Seiko, which I might trade up later down the road with a Langa because I, now I have a small collection. Service costs will be a lot easier, you know. And then I have this JLC, which I bought back because now that I kept it at three, I'm more comfortable with the watches that I have than when I have a bigger collection. And I'm kind of afraid that four of them will need a service all at once. And that's like already, let's say they're affordable watches. That's already like a thousand dollars right there. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we got another super chat from Cowboy Swami. What's the toughest production watch on the market? Uh, thanks for the super chat. I mean, obviously the G-Shock, right? But I don't know if that's mm -hmm. what you mean. Like G-Shocks are borderline indestructible that I, I i would assume you mean like um like an automatic watch uh, you know uh, a mechanical watch what's the toughest 
on uh, production model watch. Uh, man, I, I don't even know because I don't torture my watches at all. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say I baby them. But like in my recent two year update on my Submariner, people I've had people comment they're like, oh, I, I get more scratches on my watch than you've got <laughs> in like two months. And you've gotten in two years, like wear your watches. I wear the watch all like all the time. I just I, I don't I don't beat on them at all. Um, I don't know. What's your experience with like tough mechanical slash production automatic watches? I had to think about it, but I have the perfect question. And luckily, it's all under $2,000. Zinn, specifically the EZM, because I love the EZM. Go with Zinn, even though you won, actually. And uh, Ball Engineering dive watches. Mm, they oh, yeah. over-engineered over their watches. And trust me, if anybody's protecting their mechanical watches, it's Ball and Zinn. Yeah, yeah, ball like just their like crown guard little like flippy latch thing alone. Like the, it's it's over engineered. That's the perfect way to put it. Absolutely. Uh, let's try to get back to some of the earlier comments. We're trying to catch up here. Um, Adrian joined us. I don't know if Adrian's still here. That message was at four twenty two. But Bark and Jack, Adrian of Bark and Jack. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us, buddy. I'm, I'm happy that you uh, got over here to watch me and AB ramble about mostly watch servicing for the last 45 minutes. But I think it's been a good discussion. Um, watch lounge. I, I, I stay away from vintage, you know, like we had mentioned earlier. I, I also don't really do the vintage thing. Uh, let's see what other comments we have here. Watch Lounge again. Believe it or not, the watch I miss the most is the 1521 over the Zenith and the Breitling and Tudor. 1521. Why is that? Why, why is that reference escaping me? What watch is that, AB? I'm Refresh trying to. Mind. Oh man, 1521. I don't remember. Is that the. Uh... Yeah. If, if Watch Lounge is still here, remind me. I, I'm like. Yeah. I'm not, a, I'm not super like really good. Oh, okay. Remember. I don't know if he's joking, but it's the Squale. That's why it's escaping oh, us. Oh, yeah, the Squale. <laughs> of course, the Squale 1521. I did a review of that watch a while back, quite a while ago. I thought it was a good watch. I was expecting to think that it was just a pile of uh, you know, hot garbage. Um, no, no, it was nice. I liked it. I think that um, for the money, it was, it was a good dive watch, honestly. It's a nicely polished garbage. <laughs> just joking. It's actually, I like the... Um, I like the color. I think nobody really has that color down. Actually, I would rival the blue color of the 1521 with the SBDC065, the blue Seiko that uh, I think you saw it, Guy, the one I just reviewed. Mm -hmm. One of the best blue dials I've ever seen, honestly. But uh, I love the blue dial. I mean, it's a pretty standard watch. I think that watch should cost a little bit less than what it does. Um, I got really excited about it when I you know, when I first heard about it and I bought it, I got into the hype. And um, I think I sold that watch four days later, to be honest. Um, it wasn't a lot of people hyped it up to be something absolutely insane. But I mean, it's a good watch for the price. Not really. I would pay about 500 bucks for it. Um, but yeah, cool watch. It's all right. Peter says, for someone wanting to dip their toe into vintage, buy Russian. Interesting designs and so cheap, you can't get burned too deep. I would imagine that if the time comes that you need to get that watch serviced, you can absolutely forget about it. But, I mean, if you only get into it for, you know, 100 bucks or, you know, a, a small amount of money, I guess you just have fun with it for, you know, the period of time that you can. And, yeah, I mean, that, that would be applicable to anything. But, sure, Russian designs, maybe there's something out there that's cool. My dad... Uh, my dad has like military memorabilia collecting a little bit and he collects a lot of Russian old Russian military stuff. So yeah, they do make cool things back in the day. Actually remember guy, I texted you when I kind of impulsively bought an HMT. It was like a $15 mechanical watch. Um, it had all the Arabic numbers. Um, I don't know if you remember that I sent you a picture. There's this mechanical watch that I bought that I was actually pleasantly surprised with. I just never reviewed it. I think I gave it as a gift to someone, um, but it was about $15. So if you want to talk about cheap and mechanical watches, that watch was running and 15 bucks. You can't go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Robert, what is your current thinking about 
highly accurate quartz watches that are being released nowadays. Nowadays, I love high accuracy quartz watches. I want to own one at some point. The really like new, modern, crazy high ones, like um, what's that Citizen one that came out this past year? They're crazy expensive though, and like sixteen thousand dollars, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if I could spend that kind of money on on a quartz watch. I don't know if I can spend that kind of money on any watch, I guess. I shouldn't even say on a quartz watch. But something like the, what's the Grand Seiko high accuracy? Uh, like the 9F, is that the right 9F, reference? Yeah. Like I'd love to own a 9F watch. If they had a design uh, that I really, really liked, I would absolutely buy a 9F quartz Grand Seiko watch. Uh, I love accuracy. That's like one of the things that gets me kind of excited about watches in general. I like accuracy both in quartz and I like accurate mechanical watches too. Um, and I, I, I understand that there's a distinction between the two, but but yeah, I think it's cool. But the price is like on the, that Citizen watch, for example, like way, way too high. I, I personally, I don't, I love um, high accuracy quartz watches. I don't see myself having one in my collection, to be honest, because I keep my collection very minimal. And I only want to have one quartz watch and the G-Shock already um, took that spot. Yeah. Mr. Lantrick, service intervals three to five years or wait till it starts having issues, gain of loss of time, et cetera. That's a question that I've seen a lot of people ask. I'm going to be honest. I don't absolutely know the answer to this. So don't take this advice as gospel. I'm sure AB has an opinion on it too. I don't think you should service it at regular intervals it's not like getting an oil change i think you get it serviced when it needs service my understanding of for example sending a watch into rolex is the price is the price regardless of whether or not it might need a couple of parts in the movement now if you have to replace the crystal or the hands or whatever that's a completely separate issue but you know if you're just sending in the watch for a movement service I don't think they charge you extra if it needs a new balance spring or a new main spring. I think the price is the price regardless. From that perspective, if I'm correct, why send it in early? You know, It's not going to cost you more to wait. I 100% agree. Um, wait till it has a major problem. Service intervals are, I think, a way that brands can get more money. Um, if there's nothing wrong with your watch, don't do it. I know a lot of brands are starting to realize that it's annoying. That's why Richemont Group, specifically JLC, now offers um, eight-year warranty. Um, Omega, I think, did eight or ten, something like that. They're starting to realize it's a little bit annoying when, uh, when you know, customers have to. They feel like they have to bring in their watch three to five every three to five years. I've actually been to a lot of boutiques where they didn't realize I knew about watches. I was just browsing and then they would explain to me, oh, this is mechanical. Um, and then they would explain to me that every three years or something, you're going to have to bring it back to have it serviced and stuff like that. Um, kind of, I heard the term a lot, like kind of like an oil change. And it's not like that. Um, unless there's something wrong, just let it be. If you're not wearing the watch, you know, just wait until you actually want to start wearing it, then have it serviced. Unless it has a major issue, then, um, you know, take it to service. Yeah, yeah. We got a good question here. A super chat from um, Amin Reviews. Thinking about trading my sub C date. Okay, we'll stop right there. Don't ever trade a sub C date ever, ever, ever. <laughs> but beyond that, for a glass shoot original, Panamatic Lunar. Don't care about value retention. Any thoughts about this watch? I'm going to bring up a picture of it because I bet most people are not familiar with it. So let's see what's uh, what's an easy way for me to sh to do that. Um, give me one second. Here, let, let me let me give my quick answer to that. Um, I assume this is the one you're talking about. This is the uh, Panamatic Lunar with the blue dial, right? Which I think is beautiful, by the way, if this is the one you're talking about. Um, I would not trade my Submariner for any watch on the planet that I have seen so far. I love my Submariner, so I'm just going to say that from that perspective of how much I like it, I would say don't do it. But this watch is awesome looking, and I will let AB take the floor because I know he knows a lot more about glass shoot than I do. 
Yes, uh, I would absolutely. So the reason I'm biased, I actually considered this exact same thing before. I've considered trading my sub for a lot of things, but I want to be honest. I feel like you should have the sub in the collection. And, you know, if you have something else, then maybe get the Glashut. When I thought about it, I even thought, actually, my thought process was I wanted to trade my sub with a Langa 1815. I was going to trade my sub, I can't remember, whatever I can get for it, and then add two, 3,000 and get um, a white gold or even a pink gold Langa 1815 pre-owned. I think you can get them for about 11 or 12. But anyway, I thought about it. And to be honest, I feel like everybody should have a solid dive watch in their collection. And after owning multiple, multiple dive watches, I came back to the sub and realized there's just something about the Submariner that if you're a collector, you kind of have to have one, you know? Um, well, yeah, I guess the, the context that we would be missing is what else do you have in your collection? Are you going to be mm -hmm. selling your Submariner, but I still have a Seamaster or I still have, you know, other things to, to fill that role? Then maybe it becomes a little bit more of an appealing proposition. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, without that context, it would be a little bit harder to answer it. Still, even if I owned, and I like the Seamaster, so I'll use that as an example. Even if I owned a Seamaster, I still wouldn't sell my Submariner. I just love this watch way too much. Mm -hmm. I but, mean, it kind of it kind of goes to show that for you personally, you know, you absolutely love that watch, but it kind of seems like he reached the point where he's actually considering selling that watch. So I feel like he doesn't really love it that much. But that said, if the Glashut, like you're saying, is going to be your only watch, for example, um, then no, keep the Submariner. It's a more solid watch. But Glashut is, or sorry, I should say Glasuta, because a lot of people got mad at me. It's pronounced Glasuta. Um, it's an incredible watch. And you're getting so much for your money at that price. You know, you can pick this up for, I've seen them for as low as six grand. You know, you can sell the sub, buy this one, and have $2,000 or something left over for something else. You know? I mean, this watch, I'm just going to say it again. The dial is amazing. I, if this is the one specifically, if I got the right one, man, I really like that. And I'm not much of a dressy watch kind of guy. Something about that shade of blue gray, though, that is mm -hmm. that is awesome. I mean, I'd say keep the sub, save up until you can afford this, and get this as well. That's my recommendation. Yeah, but if I, if you're if you're over the Submariner, if it's just like a watch you don't like anymore, you know, get what you like. I I 100% agree. Stunning, stunning blue dial. All right, let's get back to some of these questions here. Um, Random Rob is with us. Hey, Rob, how you doing today? I don't know if you're still in the in the comments. I'm looking at <laughs> looking at comments at four thirty three. That's how far behind we are, guys. Like that always happens. We get just stacks and stacks and stacks of comments, and we can't keep up. But I'm trying my best. But yeah, Random Rob was joining us. I have. A rule. G-Shock does not count as the number in the collection. It's one of my many loopholes. I love that rule. I'm going to take that rule on. I'm stealing that idea from Rob. G-Shock does not count as a number in the collection. It's a, it's a superfluous. Gotta have it. It is completely outside bounds. So now you do have a three-watch collection because your, your G-Shock is not counting as one of the numbers of your collection. I, 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 go after, I have to go buy a watch now after this. <laughs> now, now you need your fourth watch again thanks rob excellent idea I, I i support it uh jet why does no one do watch box reviews i'm gonna be uh, totally blunt because probably people wouldn't watch them and most people do reviews so that they yeah. can get views um yeah. i did I a review a i did a review on uh watch winders a while back and yeah, nobody watched, nobody cared. I mean, I don't know, got a few views, but I like to do things that people want to see because I'm putting time and effort into it. And it's not just like, oh, I want to get views. It's like, I want people to enjoy what I'm doing and I want to enjoy what I'm doing. And part of enjoying what I'm doing is interacting and engaging with the people that are watching my videos. And I don't think anyone would really enjoy a Watchbox review too much. Maybe if it was a really cool, something special outside of the norm Watchbox, but just your typical 40 50 60 70 dollar watch boxes with the glass top and all the slots yeah i don't know if it would make such a good video i have a recommendation for a watch box if you're really 
if you like watch boxes, which I personally do, um, check out Rainer. It's a, a guy in Germany who makes handmade watch boxes. He's also on eBay, so just write Rainer watch boxes. Some I know I learned about this watch box from a lot of high end collectors, quote unquote, um, because. It was, it's just such a beautiful watch box. If you check it out, Rainer, it's very simple, matte black. Um, but if you're considering a nice watch box, I would go with Rainer. I had one and I sold it and I kind of regret it now. Um, so I might, it's weird, I regret selling a watch box, but I actually got pretty much my money back for it. <laughs> watch, watch collecting regrets, selling watch box. This is the first and last time you're ever going to hear that. I can guarantee it. Um, Let's see, brand 700. Guy, I've not seen an Explorer 2 40 millimeter review from you yet. Your thoughts on this piece? I'd like to review that watch. I just haven't had access to one. So the 40 millimeter is the older version. The current iteration is 42, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's things about the 40 that I like better, and there's obviously things about the 42 that I like better. The Explorer 2 in general, not my favorite. Rolex watch. I'd put it above a Yachtmaster. <laughs> we all know I don't really like Yachtmasters. But uh, but yeah, in, in the entire line of um, Rolex professional or sports watches, it's, you know, the Submariner, Sea Dweller is too big for me, but I think the Sea Dweller is a really cool watch too. The GMT Master, those are going to you know, be my favorites. Then I did, would even pick a, a Datejust over the Explorer two if i was you know gonna spend my money on something but then i like i do like the explorer two the explorer two is uh in a polar dial i think the black dial doesn't look quite right i think it only looks right with the white polar dial um yeah it's a cool watch and if i can ever get my hands on one you'll definitely see a video on it it's just uh uh yeah i don't have a ton of access to rolex watches in general how about you ab explorer two 40 millimeter I, I like it. I, I almost bought it, but I ended up with the sub ceramic. Um, I love it, but I hope Rolex brings out a modern Explorer with a 40 millimeter case. Um, but it's a great value so far. So I looked at them pre-owned recently. They're still, you know, better value than other Rolexes, of course. I wouldn't call it great. About not even three, four years ago, you could you could pick them up sometimes for thirty five hundred dollars. You know. Yeah, I was gonna say I remember um, them being four grand anyway. Four grand was like exceptional. You had box papers and everything. Yeah. Um, still relatively affordable. You know, comparing to other Rolexes, of course, not counting Datejust and stuff. It's a uh, it's still great value. I would go for it if um if if you had the chance to pick it up for about five grand, I wouldn't go beyond that. Um, at that point, I would just wait for them to finally re-release and explore. Fair advice. I um, I like the dial on the newer 42 better. It's, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. technically like a maxi dial or is, it, is there something a little bit more bold about it? I, I don't I know it... if it's called a maxi dial. A lot of people get mad at me when I call... Actually, yeah, sorry. It's the other way around. When I call it the maxi case, people get really mad at me. Um, so never mind. Uh, I confused it again. It's not the maxi case. It's the super case. The super the case. Maxi dial, I guess. But super case is so cheesy, though. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a superhero. And here's an interesting one. From the comments in your R Rolex sub real versus fake video, which that's my only video that's gotten a thousand or I'm so a thousand, a million views. It's like, is that really the one that had to get a million views of all the hundreds of videos I did? Did it really have to be that one? I mean, it's cool to have a video with like a million views, but it's not the one I wanted to get a million views on. Uh, but anyway, uh, seems that many folks are using your opinion of the very minute flaws on the fake to justify buying one. How do you feel about that? Ooh, I have an answer. <laughs> I'm going to be 100% uh, honest with you guys. I don't care what people do with their money. I wouldn't recommend buying fake watches. I wouldn't help somebody buying fake watches. But if if people want to do things that are illegal or morally questionable or, you know, as long as they're not hurting anybody, I, I don't really concern myself with it. My goal with that video was to make sure that people understand what's out there so they can not become a victim of a fraudulent sale. And I think that's much more important than the people that use 
that video to justify buying a fakes for me. So I think it, you know, it's a, a, a side effect that isn't really something I'm too concerned about. I mean, it's a double edged sword, right? You're, you're helping both sides in a sense. I mean, you know, I did it too, I guess you're helping both sides in a sense, but I will talk about, first of all, you're helping a lot of people when they're getting scammed, you know? So that's a really, really good thing. Um, should people use that as a way to try to perfect their fake watches? Should people use that to try to fix? For example, um, I've gotten a lot of comments um, saying that when you make these kind of videos, you're helping the replica makers to perfect their watch. Let, and let, me, let me stop you there. I've gotten that comment and I'm not exaggerating if I say hundreds of times, mm -hmm. the fake replica makers know more about these watches than I do. They don't exactly. need my help at exactly. all. That is that is the dumbest comment I get repeatedly. You're horribly misinformed if you think that that's yeah. true. 75% of the comments were like, you're helping them. And I'm like, no, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly the flaws they're making. And if they wanted to quote unquote, perfect the aesthetics of the watch, they could do that, but it's bad for business, you know, and I could go on a very long rant about it, but I'm not going to on why that would be. But trust me when I tell you those flaws that helping the replica makers, no, they, uh, they know the ins and outs, you know, the way they do those watches is they have the genuine with the genuine one with them. They dissect every inch of that watch, you know? Um, so it is a pretty, I get that stupid comment a lot. Yeah. No, I think that the uh, the video is more helpful in in a number of ways. Is it going to encourage people to buy them because they are really good lookalikes? I guess, but whatever. People are going to do whatever they're going to do with their money. It's not my fault. Yeah. I like um, Geezer's comment. I'm just going to respond to that really quick because I, I really I was actually researching about the this Royal Oak as well. He wrote Royal Oak fifteen four hundred versus fifteen five hundred. Um, Personally, out of the two, I would go with the 15400 because there's less space, there's less real estate on the dial. I feel like the 15500 has more real estate for some reason. Maybe the logo is higher up. Um, I believe they use a different caliber as well. But out of the two, I would actually go with a third one, which is the 15202, the jumbo. I think that one wears a lot better. I tried the 15400. It kind of wears very awkward on the wrist. Um, Doesn't whereas the, the 15 jumbo not have central seconds, though? Is it just... Yeah see i man i need that second sand I don't know. <laughs> you might as well buy quartz at that point huh i like i like to sync my watches to uh mm -hmm. to like uh i use time.gov as the website but there's a bunch of them right mm -hmm. and without without the second sand I'll, i'm always going to be wondering like am i off i could be mm -hmm. off i don't know I, i'm a little obsessive about that if and they have to make it thicker if they're going to add the seconds hand. But there's just something about the 15202. That, in my opinion, I'm going to say right now, is the perfect Royal Oak. Modern Royal Oak, should I say. Yeah. Speaking of geezer, here's a question from him. Thoughts on high-end aftermarket rubber straps like the Everest and the Rubber B? I did a review on the Everest. Um, Johnny uh, gave me one. He's hopefully watching today. Uh, he's on my moderator um, team, if you will, on the Just Bluefish Facebook group. I thought it was a really impressive strap. I liked it a lot. Now, I prefer to wear my Submariner on the Oyster bracelet. I prefer to wear my SKX on a bracelet. Uh, I prefer bracelets in general. But absolutely, top-notch strap. It felt like custom-made for the watch. I, yeah, I liked it. Have you ever played around with any of those Everest or Rubber Bees, AB? Um, yeah. And, uh, to be honest, I've seen a lot of aftermarket, aftermarket. So aftermarket, aftermarket rubber straps that are similar to the Everest. And, um, I wouldn't spend the money on oh, expensive, uh, <laughs> yeah, like $350 or something. If I'm spending that kind of money. Actually, there's a lot of watch straps that I regret buying, like genuine real alligator and stuff like that, that cost me about 200 bucks and stuff. I just, after buying, I have a bucket full of watch straps. I just think no strap is worth that amount of money. You know, at that I mean, point. Talk, it, talk, talk about or, like alligator or whatever. Try to buy like, uh, try to buy an OEM Omega alligator strap 
or crocodile strap, whichever. Oh yeah, for a speed, they're insane. For a speed master. It's, six, <laughs> it's like six, seven hundred bucks. Yeah, if you no. want the nice clasp. With seven hundred bucks, I'll build a Seiko collection. No, you're. It's, it's, I mean, Omega's a, there's a lot I could do with 700 bucks, and it most certainly is not going to be to buy an OEM uh, Omega strap. Especially their NATO straps. They drive me insane, the, the prices they sell their NATO straps. Right. I'm so, guilty of buying one of the NATO straps. <laughs> super guilty of it. And it oh, was, man. It's, like, I wouldn't recommend it. Like If if you've got a Speedmaster or a Seamaster and you just want an OEM NATO strap, it's not that expensive, but it is super overpriced. They're like 125 bucks something like that you know, 50 you know i'm just gonna plug it because this is honestly my honesty out of all the nato straps i've owned adrian i don't know if he's still in the comment section but his bark and jack nato straps i absolutely love those like if you're gonna buy an omega just support adrian you know what i mean his straps yeah. are awesome i liked his straps a lot i did a video on those and um phenomenato I really, mm. really like Phenomenato straps still as well. If I was going to buy an aftermarket strap that's super high quality, I would 100% recommend either of those two. Blue Sharks are nice as well. Um, Moose Company, I think they're Moose out of Canada. Strap, yeah, yeah they, they make um, good strap too. There's, there's a lot of good ones. Um, so yeah, there's really no need to go buy an expensive NATO strap from Omega. But I wanted to do a comparison and I wanted to have it. Whenever someone says like, is this high quality NATO strap good? I wanted it in my collection as a basis for which to compare other straps to. So I can always say like, look, this is just as good as the Omega and it's a third of the price. <laughs> so it's paid for itself in that regard. Yeah, no, 300 bucks, I'll buy a Seiko. I won't buy a, a Everest or an Omega strap. I have no idea how to pronounce this gentleman's name. Should I try? <laughs> you have, yes, you have, try. You have, you have, you have <laughs> Yev, Yevgenji, maybe? I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. That's a tough one for me. But he has a question. What do you guys we'll call think him about... Mr. Y. Yeah, Mr. Y asks the question. <laughs> what do you guys think about micro brands? I have an explorer in two Stovas. Is it Stova? I don't know. It's like German. Stova. Yeah. I'm considering selling the Stovas to just have the explorer. The only caveat is that Stovas get much more attention by... By what? I don't know. Um, so we'll try to field this. Oh, uh, the owner of the company, I guess he, he, he followed that up. So it's like a two part question. Um, so yeah, it's sort, sort of a, uh, worded a little weird. So let's approach yeah. it from what do you guys think about micro brands in general? Because that's a good topic. I like them and I don't like them. And here's why I like them because it adds a lot of variety. They're generally a little bit more willing and a little bit more free to do designs that are outside of the box. So you get a lot of interesting ideas, but they come with inherent risk. And that is, where is this brand going to be in two years, three years, four years, five years? Is they're using a quality movement that can be serviced by anyone anywhere? It's probably a non-issue, but what if inside of a year or two, your watch breaks while it's still under warranty? I have talked to people that have gotten some of the more affordable micro brands and had to fight with the customer service to get those watches repaired under warranty. I mean, I had one guy, I'm not going to name the brand because they did finally take care of them. I mean, he was asking me to help him. And I'm like, look, like he's right. This watch should be fixed under warranty. And you know, if, if you don't, I'm going to make a video talking about how you don't support your customers because I thought the way that they were treating them was really bad. And in the end, they caved. Had I not gotten involved and kind of threatened them to, to say, like, do you want, you know, everybody that's on social media to know how you treat your customers? They may not have caved. They may have just told them to stick it. Um, so, yeah, I like some things about them. On the other hand, there's things about them I don't like. So I'm going to give try to give a very quick answer. Micro brands are many times they fill a niche, something that a lot of people don't. So a lot of people that want specific things from Seiko that they're not getting from Seiko, micro brands tend to fill that. There's a lot of really cool 39 millimeter watches by Mehu, for example, Baltic. Um, and they're using movements that are very easy to service, you know, Miyota movements, ETA movements. So those are fine. Um, I've had firsthand experience, and I've talked to you about this before, Guy, 
and I'm not going to mention the name because, you know, I decided not to. Um, there's a few micro brands I don't like when you're buying a micro brand to me personally, it's like buying from an independent watchmaker. It's kind of like art. You're buying into the people who are investing their time and effort into those watches. Um, like independent watchmakers, for example, I would buy an FP Jorn because I like what he does. You know, I like the, per the watchmaker specifically. Same with micro brands. I like specific brands. There's a lot of brands that um, they just want to make a better world of watch collecting. And then there's other brands, you know, they have, you know, I've, I've talked to you about it before. Some of them, they just have really terrible customer service. I've told you before about a specific CEO that I can't believe he owns a watch company. You know what I mean? By the way, he emailed me back and forth. Um, so when it comes to micro brands, oh, I, I would, remember you told me about that. Yeah, that was like you were treated super unprofessionally by that yeah, person. Yeah, it was. And he's very, very, very popular. I can't I'm not going to say the name, but he's very popular. Um, but regardless, I just think that when it comes to micro brands, I would search up the company first. I would search up who owns this company first. Um and kind of gauge their popularity to see how long they will last and like, you know, trust your judgment and then go with microbrands because there's a lot of really cool ones. I personally really respect Baltic. I respect mm -hmm. Helios. Um, Helios has been in the game for about 10 years now. Um, the, the, the guy who asked this question said Stova. Stova, I don't think is a microbrand. They're a lot bigger than that. Yeah, I don't um, know if they're necessarily considered a microbrand, are they? It's kind of like Laco as well, right? They're kind of in that mm -hmm. same... Sort of, they're they're yeah. bigger micro brand. Um, they're in a weird spot in between mainstream and micro brand. They're like somewhere here in the middle, you know. Um, right. But yeah, there. If you buy properly, you can have a lot of fun with micro brands. Yeah, there, there's good and there's bad, but be smart, like you said, do a little research. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Bobby Leg says, I used to hate snowflake hands, but I love them now. I love my Black Bay 58. I still hate snowflake hands. <laughs> I, I don't know why. It's like something about that, yeah, that hour hand. It just looks like it's stumped off on the end. And I don't know. I can't get into it. Uh, next comment by UE2012. Snowflake hands are fantastic, so legible, better than Mercedes, I think. Totally disagree. I like the Mercedes hands better. Um, they, they are more legible, though. Let, let me be devil's advocate here. The snowflake hands are more legible, but with the lack of anti-reflective on both of them, <laughs> I, you know, that that's my problem with legibility when it comes to Rolex and, and Tudor. Um, I like the snowflake hands. I think they're unique. They're cool. And it's very, very hard. People underestimate how hard it is to come up with a unique um, handset, you know? Yeah, sure. Um Snowflake versus Mercedes, if you had to pick, though, which do you prefer? It depends on the watch. I'm not going to lie. I cop can't out. see. Oh, yeah. You know, I the, type of hands, the type of hands that I like a lot, like, I, don't, I don't dislike the Mercedes hands, but I'm not a super big fan of Snowflake, though. But I like just the standard kind of, um, what would you call them? Like stick hands on a date chest? Or mm -hmm. I like syringe hands, like on my yeah. Hamilton. You know what? I'm gonna. This is a little bit biased, but I'm gonna tell you guys who I think makes the best hands: Grand Seiko and JLC. Specifically, the Moon Phase or this one. The way they do it is half of the hand is polished, and then half of the hand is kind of brushed or bead blasted. This is genius. The legibility on this watch. This watch is beyond legible. It's so complicated. There's a power reserve, a date, world timer, a, um, a second time zone, seconds hand. It's very complicated. But when they made half of the hand brushed, half of the hand polished, um, it it's absolutely insane. It's sword hands, which is my favorite as well. Um, but when it comes to hands, I don't know why people don't do that. I don't know why they don't focus more on their on their um on their hands i find like a lot of really expensive watch brands as well they don't finish their hands very very well you know um it's something that's kind of under you know undervalued i i can't um i can't think of the word but they don't focus more on maybe underappreciated, yeah um uh solid solid stud asked what watch is he wearing you're wearing the jlc master geographic right yeah uh caliber 929 so this is the one of the oldest ones, um, my favorite. Jack says he was offered a Black Bay 58 and a Black Bay GMT. 
did well did, did you get either of them i would definitely consider that 58 i don't like the gmt as much personally no it, it just um i know a lot of people like it but it it i don't want to sound snobby but it sounds i feel like it's for a lot of people who really want the pepsi but then just get an a just get a more affordable alternative. And I'm not a big advocate, I guess, on um, getting alternatives to what you really want, you know, assuming you can afford it. But uh, I just feel like it looks, it's just way too similar to a Pepsi, um, to a Pepsi a Rolex GMT. But that being said, I've heard from jewelers um, who sell a lot of these watches that a lot of these watch brands that use Pepsi um, bezels they do that because it actually sells a lot. So any brand that uses a Pepsi bezel, that's usually one of their most popular watches that they sell. Yeah, everyone loves that red and blue motif. I mean, I do. I, you know, I got the SKX009. I want a GMT Master 2 Pepsi. I think it's a cool design. So it makes sense. Uh, yeah. Shaitan in Chicago. This probably goes back to the question someone asked earlier about a tough, you know, tough production watches. He says R Richard Milne makes some tough mechanical watches. I will not be able to confirm that because um, there's no version of reality where I will ever be able to afford to own a Richard Mill. Uh, but apparently, <laughs> but apparently, with little Beckham Jr., you know, allegedly won one, wore one while he was playing football, right? Actually, it turned out that that was fake. It was fake. Yeah. That but, was marketing genius that was incredible mark you know what i dislike daniel wellington as much as the next collector but that was marketing genius um yeah, but pe but people might not know the story so maybe we should set this up with context odell beckham jr is a football player and he was wearing allegedly a richard mill while he played a game i think it was in the week three or week four of the season we're already on about week 10 now so this was going back two months maybe mm -hmm. and then what happened next ab so what, what he did was he kind of like it, it created a lot of controversy around the watch, but then out of nowhere, uh, Daniel Wellington announced that he's the new brand ambassador for, and then but, but I first, think, but first during an interview before that came out, didn't somebody say like, why are you wearing this watch or something? And he's like, it's not that nice anyway. It's a Daniel yeah. Wellington's a nicer no, watch. He said, I'd rather wear a Daniel Wellington. And, and that was, was this was before they actually announced that he was a brand ambassador. So there was like this low key kind of shenanigans going on yeah. there. So I think that, the, I mean, I, I don't think, I know it's positive. When I heard that he said that I think Daniel Wellington is better. That's when I put my tinfoil hat on and I was like, Hmm. <laughs> and then that's when I kind of realized, okay, there's some marketing going on, but he used what is known as the most expensive watch in the world, which we know is not, but to the eyes of, um, the masses that was the most expensive like watch you can probably buy um and then he promoted something that's extremely cheap you know what i mean he said this one is better than the most expensive watch in the world that marketing alone with a football player like that is absolutely genius you know what i mean um but sort of shady the way it happened it is, it is shady. i mean let's be honest daniel wellington's entire brand is shady so uh, like those those watches are you know, probably maximum 25 cents to make, you know, and then they're selling it as, you know, affordable luxury. And um, it was shady, but it is marketing genius. Like sometimes you have to respect at least um, the thought process on how they did that. You know what I mean? One of our, one of the biggest, you know, guys here in the watch community is John claude Beaver. And he used to do stuff like this all the time. He went to Basel World once with to present no watches, you know what I mean? Just to get everybody talking about his brand, instead of showing up with, you know, one watch or anything, he showed up with nothing. And that yeah. got everybody to talk about the brand because everybody started lying and like being like, oh, did you see the watch? Oh, I saw the watch, but you did it. And they started, everybody was talking about it. And it was that marketing genius that got his brand, you know, up there. Um, so you, I at least got to respect their marketing, um, you know, thought process. Sure. Uh, here's a question. Submariners, Daytonas, Explorers, everybody speaks about these Rolexes, but nobody talks about the Datejust 41. Is it outdated? I don't think it's outdated at all. I think the both Datejust, the 41 and the 36, are not the like 
hot popular model, but I think most people that like Rolexes like those models. There's people that just, you know, don't, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to own a date just personally. Uh, it's, it's on my list of watches to get at some point in my life. Most people that I've talked to say like, it's one of the watches that they've owned or they're thinking about owning. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's outdated. I, I think that it's just everyone is crazy for these watches that are limited supply, hard to find. You know, it, there's just a lot of hype around those other watches. And I think that has more to do with it than any sort of lack of interest in the Datejust. I, I will just mirror that. The only reason the Datejust is not talked about is because people can still get it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's available. Pretty much. If it's not available, trust me, everybody will be talking about the Datejust. But that will never happen. The amount of Datejust Rolex are trying to sell it is ridiculous. <laughs> UE2012. Never been on while well, one of these have been live, being ignored, but it's fun. No, we've, we've looked at a couple <laughs> of his comments, haven't we? I, like I said, yeah. uh, I'm, I am now looking at comments that were posted at 4.56. So we yeah. are 33 minutes behind on getting into the comments. And we won't, we won't be able to get to all of them. We're running up close to an hour and a half here. We're probably going to wrap it up soon. Um, so the moral of the story is subscribe, turn on your notifications. And when you see that we're going live, get here early. Yeah, I, I'm super sorry. Like my schedule is all over the place. So sometimes I'm just going to text a guy and be like, hey, are you up for a live? And if he's not, you know, if he's not busy, we'll just kind of like today randomly do it. Uh, but I'm trying my best to come up with something. Me and Guy are talking about something right now that could potentially work out to be a more consistent thing. Um, but yeah, we de definitely, we're not ignoring comments. It's just, um, it's hard to get to every one of them. Even my laptop died, so I can't even see any of those comments anymore. What did you do to kill it? I just forgot the battery. <laughs> I forgot to charge it. All right. Let's see if I can kind of scroll through here and see if any of these last handful of, uh, questions or comments stick out to me before we sign off. Cause yeah, I think an hour and a half is pretty good. Jack said night. He's gonna take off uh thanks for joining us jack have a good night see you jack uh, let's see um mostly the people are talking amongst themselves at this point when is your next explorer video coming guy turkey vulture asked uh so i had an explorer on loan for the last week or so and um yeah i'm gonna do a kind of uh, a retrospective uh, ret i can't speak retrospective do I regret having sold that watch video? Got to finish editing on the video and uh, doing the commentary portion. Sometime in the next week, though. We should see that video sometime in the next week. Have you done an Explorer video yet, AB? No, and I regret not doing it because I had a 36 mil. Um, I had it in hand, but I just never made a video. There's a few watches that... I don't know why I didn't review it. I had uh, a Batman that I didn't re review for some reason. I still have the f a few footage actually I could put together. Um, but the thing with the Explorer is I am not that big of a fan of the 39 millimeter version. Um, and I feel like if I have more, I suppose, negatives to say about a watch than positive, sometimes I tend to just stay away from that because I, I don't want to be too negative. And I'm not a fan of the 39 millimeter Explorer, to be, you know, very honest. Yeah. Uh, here's kind of a weird one, but I'll go ahead and pull it up. Chi Town, California. Would you either of you rather own six cheap mechanical watches or five cheap quartz watches and one tier mechanical watch? Um, I don't. I don't. I, I mean. I don't look at it that way. So I don't know if I can answer that question. It's like, I'd rather own what I like. And the things that I like about watches don't generally revolve around whether they're mechanical or automatic. I like, or, or quartz rather. I like both. Um, it's going to be the design. It's going to be, um, you know, a number of factors. So, so yeah, I don't know. Like, do I really like that one mid-tier mid mechanical watch more than any of those other cheap mechanicals? And not, you know, that would be the option. But but realistically, if I don't like it, I wouldn't own it. So I don't when you say cheap quartz watch or cheap mechanical watch, that sort of 
I don't know, implies like it's not good. Like I would view it as being not good. And that's probably not what you mean. Uh, it's it's a weird question though. So yeah, I, I can't really answer it other than as to say, whichever one had the most watches that I liked in that collection, I guess. My answer is one one decent watch. <laughs> yeah. Just, <laughs> just one decent watch. Because I mean, watch, yeah. It kind of, I don't know what cheap stands for. I mean, cheap like Danny Wellington and Richard Mill cheap or or what kind of cheap he's talking about. I'm talking about like, right, I'm so cheap, cheap, cheap usually has like the negative con connotation. When yeah. you say the word cheap, right? You think kind of bad, but cheap could also Fashion just mean affordable. Watches. Cheap could also mean affordable and affordable isn't necessarily bad. It's, it's a little bit of a loaded question. Look, if you say affordable, if you change the word cheap to affordable, I'll go with six affordable mechanical watches. I can already create a whole collection in my mind like that. But this question, I mean, honestly, I would just buy one really decent watch and I'd be happy with that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Most of the people are just chatting amongst themselves and not, we're not getting too many questions. So I think at this point, we're at an hour and 31 minutes. Let's go ahead and wrap up this video. Um, to, to any questions that I didn't get to, of course, I apologize. Hopefully, um, after the fact, I, if I rewatch this, I'll, I'll see them and I can maybe address them in the comments. Or next time we do a live stream, like I said, subscribe, turn on notifications. And when you see that we're going on, get in as early as you can and get those questions in. Because as you can see, hour and a half and we didn't quite get to through all of the questions. Uh, but thanks for everyone that joined us. I think at one point we actually had 100 viewers. We're up to 82 right now. Um, that's awesome. I think that might be the most viewers we've ever had during a live stream. So that's actually really encouraging. I guess you guys enjoy the show. Like I said, AB is here to carry the show. I'm just his sidekick. And I make yeah, sure that he doesn't say. get too carried away. <laughs> hey, I, I held myself really well this time. <laughs> nah, you, you're always fine. Uh, you you just have a lot of really good information to share. I, I don't begrudge uh, whatsoever. But yeah, I'm going to wrap this one up. Thanks again, AB, for joining me. Thanks to everybody else for watching. And until the next one, bye now. Thanks for having me, guys.